Protecting animal species targeted for trade in Guyana is attracting the attention of the Ministry of Natural Resources and the Environment. Globally, wildlife conservation has become an increasingly important practice due to the negative effects of human activity on animals and the environment. The importance of managing and conserving Guyana's wildlife is at the forefront of wildlife management and conservation regulations and is a key tool in the efforts of authorities to effectively regulate the sector. This week on Eldorado Shines, we will tell you a bit more about the steps which are being taken in Guyana to protect animal species and preserve their habitat. I always encourage your passengers not to throw garbage out of the window. Stop littering. Do the right thing. Guyana's wildlife management and conservation regulations will enable the development of systems, including penalties and mechanisms for enforcement for the protection of local wildlife. We've been working on these regulations for a number of years. Mm -hmm. and in fact, they have been found um, to be necessary within our overall drive in terms of wildlife conservation and management. And also they're found to be necessary if you're going to fully effect and implement the EP Act. And over a number of years, both with local as well as international expertise, DFID being one of those entities, as well as widespread stakeholder consultation, because they will impact on a number of stakeholders and we wanted to ensure that the development of the regulations reflected the views of the communities, reflected the views of all those who may have concerns and the wider Guyanese public. Wildlife smuggling is important because of the effect that it can have on the environment. Our bi bi biodiversity is very important. Uh, you need to protect your populations. And if you are smuggling, you have trade that is taking place, because if it's going cross borders, it's considered trade, but it's just that it's illegal. You have trade that is taking place that is not being registered. So you do not have a, a good handle on the impact on your populations. And so it can severely affect your populations. As business operators, we need to be responsible. Stop littering. Do the right thing. The Wildlife Import and Export Bill will complement the Wildlife Management and Conservation Regulations. The bill will provide a national framework and mechanism to govern the international trade of all species of wildlife in Guyana. The illegal movement of animals also creates conditions for the spread of diseases, which can have potentially serious consequences. Moving wildlife from one location to another uh, can transport diseases. So if you're doing it illegally, uh, this is being done without the input of veterinarians who can inspect the animals to determine their health. And so that can have de devastating consequences on your local flo flora and fauna. Licensed wildlife exporters are required to hold the animals in a licensed holding station. Um, there are certain requirements in, for the export of certain animals. So for instance, for the birds, you have to hold them in the station for at least one month prior to export. Mammals is also one month prior to export. And so this gives time, if, if there are diseases um, present, for the diseases to manifest itself. And also just prior to export, there, there must be a request for a health certificate. And an inspection is done by a veterinarian attached to the Guyana Livestock Development Authority to ascertain the health of the animals. The Environmental Protection Agency, the lead entity responsible for wildlife conservation, is putting a wide range of mechanisms in place to protect species at risk and deal with those engaged in the illegal wildlife trade. So as, re as it relates to local wildlife trade, we're speaking about the trade, whether it be to buy, sell um, wildlife species of both plants and animals. As it relates to the recently enacted wildlife management and conservation regulations, it speaks, it speaks specifically to local wildlife trade. So those involved in trapping, hunting, otherwise buying and selling wildlife 
uh, having the, the, these regulations speak to these individuals. Through the wildlife management and conservation regulations, there is a need to establish a licensing process which will capture those, everyone dealing with in wildlife. So for example, those who are presently dealing in the bushmeat trade, local pet trade, those individuals will have to, will be required to get a license. Now the Wildlife Management Authority is responsible for the regulation of the international wildlife trade. Now in terms of monitoring and enforcement, the Management Authority relies on collaboration with other agencies, specifically the Guyana Revenue Authority and the Guyana Police Force. Measures are also being put in place to specifically deal with persons hunting and gathering wildlife locally. The overall intention is for us to have guidelines, have as it were regulations, for us to develop systems, for us to develop as well as offenses and penalties and, and so forth, so that we can conserve and adequately manage our li wildlife. As it, as it is now, um, people would complain that you have, whether it's overhunting, overfishing, the total disrespect in terms for spawning season, whether you're dealing with, um, with, with fish or, or dealing with, with other species in, in terms of giving the, the species time in terms of procreate, you have sometimes um, the little ones are being catch and, and, and if you also travel along certain um, roadways within our hinterland, you will see sometimes containers upon containers are what we call ice boxes. Mm -hmm. And when you check those boxes there, they contain what we call wild meat of different species. The wildlife collecting license are for those individuals who are specifically hunting, gathering wildlife species. So we can think of those involved in the bushmeat trade or those trapping animals for pets, for, for example, um, macaws, parrots, songbirds. Uh, those individuals, through the licensing process, we, it would assist the Environmental Protection Agency in monitoring locally the trade of wildlife. Um, through the licensing process, individuals will be required to have on, in their possession this license that will be issued, and that in, in itself will help to monitor the trade locally. So those who are not legally um, those who are not legally um, trading, that is, have a, a valid license, are guilty of a crime. We must do everything we can to keep our surroundings clean. Stop littering. Do the right thing. Boasting some 75% pristine rainforest, Guyana is home to more than 8,000 species of plants, mammals, birds, fishes, reptiles and amphibians, and countless invertebrates. New regulations will also require persons to provide a report of their activities as it relates to hunting and gathering wildlife. Part of the wildlife collecting license system it will require those holders to report at the end of the, the whatever period the license valid for uh, how, what, what, what wildlife species they dealt with, how much they collected, where they collected. And this is actually part of the licensing process. You must, must report. Again, this helps for those, the, the agency and the ministry to track what species are being targeted and so put things in place in terms of conservation efforts. New litter prevention regulations will come on stream from March 2014. Stop littering. Do the right thing. Steps towards the conservation of biodiversity will promote protecting and sustaining wildlife. Over the years, Guyana has taken and will continue to take such steps. Commercial operators involved in the sale of wildlife will also be required to meet certain guidelines and adhere to regulations. There is also the commercial license. This speaks to those who will be buying or selling. So whether it's the trapper who is going to be selling his, his wildlife or a middleman who will be bringing it out to the, to the coast to sell locally, those individuals require a commercial license. 
Acts of cruelty towards wildlife will also be engaging the attention of authorities and those found guilty of such offenses will be penalized. Wildlife regulations also capture cruelty to wildlife. So those acts of, of, of cruelty we sometimes observe where, for example, uh, people go to hunt deer and lava, they might come across a savannah fox and shoot at it for fun. Those things will be addressed through the regulations and there are fines and penalties in place for that. A quota system will also be established to limit the number of animals hunters are allowed to take per year. Under wildlife management and conservation regulations, they also speak to setting, establishing quotas as it relates to what, uh, how much wildlife can be taken in a given year and also open and closed seasons. Uh, this, these dates and quotas have to be set in consultation with the Wildlife Scientific Authority established under the Wildlife Division. Also on the radar of authorities in Guyana is the international trade of endangered species. Authorities around the world suspect they are intercepting fewer than 10% of all the wildlife smuggling, with many saying it's less than 1%. Guyana is a signatory to a convention that aims to ensure that international trade of specimens of wild animals and plants does not threaten the survival of the species in the wild. Guyana is a party to CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Now, as a party to CITES, Guyana is obligated to implement the provisions of the Convention, and it does this through its legislation. In place, we have the Species Protection Regulations 1999, which was made pursuant to the Environmental Protection Act of 1996. There are plans in place to repeal the Species Protection Regulations and to enact the Wildlife Import and Export Act. The Convention was established really out of the growing concern that the international trade in wildlife could eventually become detrimental to the species. And so it was recognized that while the wildlife trade is valuable, it needs to be regulated. Societies is, is not aiming to put a stop to the trade, it's just ensuring responsible regulation. And it does this through several mechanisms. One, by assigning various levels of protection to the species, and two, through a system of permits. Now, in terms of the levels of protection, there are three levels of protection, Appendix 1, Appendix 2, and Appendix 3. Appendix 1 lists species that are considered endangered or threatened with extinction, and commercial trade is prohibited. Uh, Non-commercial trade may be permi permitted in exceptional circumstances. So, for instance, if species are going to be exported for research purposes, and this would be non-commercial research purposes. In terms of Appendix 2 species, it regulates the, the trade in those species. Commercial trade is permitted, but it must be regulated. So these are species that are not threatened with extinction at this point, but if the trade is not regulated, it may become threatened in the future. And so in order to trade those species, permits would be required. Before the permits are issued, the scientific authority must give advice to the management authority as to whether the particular transaction, whether it be export or import, would be detrimental to the survival of the species. And the third level of protection is Appendix 3. Now, this is a listing by a particular country. So for the first two, Appendix 1 and Appendix 2, the entire conference of parties would have to agree on the listing of Appendix 1 or 2. In terms of Appendix 3, the individual country can, uh, can decide that they want to place a particular species on this appendix. Tighter measures will also be put in place to address the incidence of wildlife smuggling, which is a major concern both nationally and globally. The issue of smuggling of wildlife is, is a matter of concern for all countries. And this is why you see a growing membership of, of CITES. There are now 180 parties to CITES. And it, it shows the cooperation among countries to address this very serious issue. In terms of what the management authority is doing, it, it's basically improving the capacity of the enforcement agencies because we do have to rely on the enforcement agencies to help us uh, address smuggling of wildlife. And so the Wildlife Management Authority is continuing its efforts to train and boost the capacities of those agencies. 
Not without its challenges, the Environmental Protection Agency and other stakeholders are constantly examining options that would serve to make the implementation of regulations even more effective. I think one of the major things that we need is to have an area to hold wildlife if it's confiscated. Um, and this is something we're looking at in collaboration with the Protected Areas Commission. Because if, if you come across smuggled wildlife, you need to do confiscation. You have to have somewhere to house it. The second would be further training for the enforcement agencies in terms of actually handling and caring for the species involved if there is a confiscation. So those are actually the two major areas um, that, that I'm concerned with. And of course, the third well, would be the passage of the Import and Export Bill. Illegal trade in wildlife is said to be the second largest illegal trade in volume, second to narcotics and followed by arms and ammunition. Interpol has estimated the extent of the illegal wildlife trade between $10 billion and $20 billion per year. Authorities in Guyana are committed to implementing measures for the protection of endangered species and combating of illegal wildlife trade. All Guyanese are being encouraged to support this initiative. It's not just the, the owners of the government and those um, sectors involved, but also those directly involved in wild, local wildlife trade. So, in that regard, the agency wishes to encourage all those involved in the coming, in the coming months as we look to implement the wildlife management and conservation regs to lend their support. Our wildlife, those are our resources and we need to protect the resources and when I'm saying protect it doesn't mean that, that we, we wouldn't use our resources but it's using it responsibly. Now someone who is smuggling wildlife, as I said before, it's, we, we are not recording those exports or those movements so we do not have an idea what impact it's having on the actual population. A registered trader, those person's transactions are all recorded so we know what impacts those create. But for the smuggler, we have no idea. And so you're destroying your own resources because once you're exploiting heavily, if the resource becomes depleted, the smuggler himself can't benefit from it at a later date. So it's a matter of preserving our resources for future use. And I would recommend trying to, to find out what the licensing requirements are uh, and, and just legalizing an operation. At the end of the day, it is not to take, as it were, literally food out of people's yeah. mouth, but rather is to ensure that generations to come can also participate in the wealth of our nation, and this is part of our wealth of our nation. And the point is made too that, you know, if we recognize that a particular species threatened one way or the other, we can also classify <coughs> that area wildlife conservation area, and that is provided for. New litter prevention regulations will take effect from March 2014. A person who transports along a public place any material that is likely to fall off or blow off shall be guilty of an offence. In the case of an individual, the penalty will be a fine of $50,000 or in the case of a business, a fine of $100,000. Stop littering. Do the right thing. A message from the Ministry of Natural Resources and the Environment. Minister of Natural Resources and the Environment, Robert Persaud, has expressed serious concerns with the low production level of the Aquarian sector. In January, quarry production was recorded at 50,197 tons compared to 52,360 tons for the corresponding period in 2013. So far, for the month of February, the figures remain unsatisfactory. In January early this year, I had convened a meeting with all quarry operators and producers, as well as a number of government agencies and ministries um, that are involved uh, and do have projects that require quarry and quarry material, be it the Ministry of Public Works, the Sea Defense Unit, the Roads Unit, the Central Housing and Planning Authority, and, and others. The aim of that meeting in January was to advise quarry producers of the projects and some of the projections so that they can ensure that their operations are so tailored and are so structured that they can satisfy demand. 
we were given the assurance by all the operators that they intended not only to maintain their 2013 level, which was in fact considerably higher than 2012, but also to increase and expand that. We then had a subsequent meeting last week, whereby we met again with the operators as well as a number of government agencies, and I requested the agencies to supply to the producers some of the projections that they had and in terms of estimated demand for different quarry material, and that was done. And was for the first time we were able to do that. But I'm still dissatisfied that the operators are not responding and are not, as it were, producing adequately to satisfy the immediate demands, be it for roads and be it for other areas of the construction sector. A number of reasons have been provided to the ministry. Uh, one being in terms of equipment failure, second in terms of labor supply, thirdly in terms of logistics. And there were even issues in terms of um, uh, clearing of equipment and spares and we met with the GRA and the GRA met uh, with the operators in terms of smoothing that out and we continue to engage them. But we believe that much more can be done and I want to encourage quarry producers to step up to increase their production, increase their own output. And in fact, this matter was discussed recently at the level of the cabinet. And the cabinet, in fact, has given me the mandate to review even the conditions of quarry license to ensure that this natural resource is adequately utilized and that we are in a situation whereby the country's development is not held back because of inadequate supplies of quarry and quarry material, which is so essential. We have uh, a road program of in excess of $3 billion uh, that requires substantial amount of quarry material. We have in terms of road housing construction, uh, a number of sea defense projects. And many of the government as well as the private contractors are themselves complaining and have reported of their inability to access type and quantity that they need, and there have been some concerns about pricing. But pricing is an issue that will have to be determined by the market, and we don't want to get involved in terms of looking at the issue of pricing. Our primary interest is that quarry operators and producers must increase and improve their production as they have promised, and, they, uh, and that is the basis on which they were given a quarry license, the basis of which they've given access to this area. Uh, and so we will be looking at the conditions of the license. Secondly, we want to encourage other investors who may be interested in developing quarry uh, to come in, come into the GGMC and to look at areas that might be available so that they can start the paperwork in this regard so that we can have more players, more competition in this regard. But it is an issue, an issue of concern to the government and I again want to encourage and implore uh, the quarry operators uh, that we are not dissatisfied with the coming to the end of the second month. Uh, we've looked at January production. It is a bit below what was the same production, uh, but, but what was recorded in January 2013. And certainly with the reports we've gotten and what we've seen some of the output, um, we want to sound this warning. We want to issue this call very early and to show that you know it's an issue that we take very seriously. That this, this particular operator can't meet the demand or um, just can't reach that, that level that we're looking for, then what? Well, there are a number of options, one of which is that um, the importation of stone, that, and a number of contractors and operators are in fact doing that. Secondly is that we will continue to engage all quarry operators and to look very carefully at their operations and, and to ensure uh, that they are working in accordance with the plan they've submitted. And then in the review process of the license to put much more stringent conditions to ensure that if people have this resource that they utilize it or if they cannot utilize it that they relinquish it so that we can provide it to others. It's very simple. And I'm not threatening anyone, I'm just saying that we need to ensure that we you know, our country will possess a tremendous vast resource in terms of quarry, and this should not be an issue in, in terms of uh, us 
and, and stakeholders complaining about inadequate supply and availability. Quarry operators and producers need to step up and they need to fulfill even what they have themselves presented, their projections and their plans. We recognize that there have been difficulties, but we believe much more can and ought to be done. Guyana is making more lands and resources available for mineral production and investments in the natural resources sector. These initiatives are being pursued in keeping with the country's commitment to protect the environment. Welcome to Guyana, the gateway to South America. a pristine haven of abundant natural resources. We are a nation born in sacrifice and enriched by our togetherness. When we play, we celebrate every effort. When we celebrate, we salute more than success. We exude our right to move forward. You've been watching Eldorado Shines. Do join us again next week for another program. Until then, remember we all have a role to play in protecting the environment.